on this episode of What's Going On with Shipping, with a looming crisis between Ukraine and Russia, we examine how America's military can sea lift to the Ukraine. I am your host, Sam Coglano. So many of you watch What's Going On with Shipping for my take and interpretation on what's going on with commercial shipping. But my doctoral dissertation was on the role of what's called military sea lift. That is the application of commercial shipping for the use of a nation's military. In particularly, what I examined was the role of the American Merchant Marine in national defense from the Spanish-American War up and until the Iraq War of 2003. With the confrontation going on currently between Russia and the Ukraine, I thought I'd take a moment and examine what is America's seal of capacity and capabilities right now should a conflict erupt between those two countries and the U.S. decides to intervene militarily. Let me be clear, I don't condone this. I am not advocating this. This is not what I'm talking about. I've been in a war, never want to see a war happen. I'm a military historian who studies conflicts and don't interpret this as a advocacy for the U.S. to militarily intervene. However, what I would like to show is what capabilities we currently have and where there are gaps in our capability that we need to address in the future. So first, let's look at the history before we jump in to current capabilities. So as I mentioned, I have looked at this topic quite a bit, written an entire dissertation on it, and I've written extensively on this subject. So America's military sea lift capability really enters the modern period at, during the Spanish-American War of 1898. When the U.S. declares war in Spain, we have to charter, basically get from the commercial fleet, a transport force to get troops, not just from the United States, from Tampa, Florida to Cuba, but also across the Pacific to the Philippines. And at the end of the Spanish-American War, the United States finds itself an imperial power. It controls a batch of possessions across the world, Cuba in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Guam, and the Philippines. And it needs a dedicated fleet to sustain that because commercial vessels are not going to these places. So the U.S. Army, yes, the U.S. Army, acquires a fleet of transport vessels, names them after famous Civil War Union generals. So you get ships like the Buford and the Meade and the Grant uh, and the Megs and the Meade. And these vessels will be used to basically sustain the U.S. military. Now, in times of added conflict, for example, putting down the Philippine insurrection for use during the Boxer Rebellion in China for uprisings in Cuba, the U.S. will supplement this fleet with commercial vessels. And that's the norm for about 20 years until you hit World War I. Now, in World War I, the United States enters the war late, is thrust into war by an attack on its commercial merchant marine. And so the U.S. initially uses its existing fleet, its coastwise fleet, and several vessels that are in international trade to deploy the first units of what is known as the American Expeditionary Force. However, the U.S. military lacks, and the U.S. Merchant Marine lacks, sufficient tonnage to support a two million person expeditionary force. So the U.S. goes for two other sources for vessels. One are internships in U.S. harbors, German vessels, about 20 transports are taking over. Vessels like this, the, what becomes the USS George Washington is used. And second, we rely on allies, largely the British, to haul over the vast majority of the US expeditionary force during World War I. And because of our reliance on foreign merchant marines, we see post-World War I, the enactment of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, which aims to create a commercial merchant marine where we can rely on for coastal and international trade, but also form the core of a naval auxiliary in time of war, including transports. World War II comes around and the United States finds itself in a better position than it did in World War I. The US realized that war was on the horizon, President Franklin Roosevelt and the US Congress authorized the Merchant Marine Act of 1936, which began a government building program to start building ships, build up the infrastructure in U.S. shipyards so that in 1940, those shipyards can transfer over to building Navy vessels and that commercial capability can be allocated to new yards. The very first ship in that program that was built was this one right here, the SS America, which became the USS West Point. 
during World War II. During World War II, we also build a fleet of transports, uh, 20 P-2 transports and 30 C-4 transports. And those become really the bedrock along with victory ships and other cargo vessels that serve the United States all the way through the Vietnam War in terms of military transportation. In the 1990s, when the United States and the United Nations find themselves in a conflict in the Middle East, dealing with the defense of Saudi Arabia and the liberation of Kuwait, the US realizes that the commercial merchant marine, the US merchant marine is in a state of decline. We've seen the rise of other merchant marines, particularly what are known as open registries. And so the US decides to establish a reserve fleet of vessels that could be called upon to surge across and deploy them. And they buy vessels on the open market, for example, the eight Sealand SL7 fast container ships and convert them into what are known as fast sea lift ships, as you see right here with the USNS Algol, one of eight of these fast sea lift ships. These ships were instrumental in the deployment of the first heavy division, the 24th Infantry Division from Fort Stewart, Georgia via Savannah to Kuwait in 1990. Uh, in 2003, when the United States invades Iraq, and we'll talk about the issue regarding that, but when they go to invade Iraq in 2003, the lessons learned from 1990 are incorporated and the United States has increased its surge sea lift capacity by the conversion and construction of 20 large medium speed roll on roll off vessels what are known in the military as LMSRs because we have to have an acronym for everything. Uh, and we also established a program where commercial vessels could be used to supplement this known as the maritime security program. So that's the history. What does that mean for today? If something happens tomorrow, and again, this is just hypothetical, not advocating this at all, but should a conflict happen where the US decides to deploy forces you know, beyond what's currently in Europe. In other words, we're gonna take forces that aren't in Europe and deploy them there. What forces would go? How will we get them there? And what are the, the, the vessels and the assets that are available? So let's look at that now. So should the US military decide it has to intervene and send forces to Europe? The entity that would oversee this are two in terms of shipping. First, there's the United States Transportation Command located at Scott Air Force Base. Uh, the U.S. Transportation Command was created in the late 1980s, uh, a joint command that oversees transportation both on air, land, and sea. And the sea component of the United States Transportation Command is an entity known as the Military Sea Lift Command. The Military Sea Lift Command came into existence post-World War II. It was initially called the Military Sea Transportation Service, in 1949, it was renamed Military Sea Lift Command in 1970. It's headquartered in Norfolk, Virginia, commanded by a two-star U.S. Navy Admiral. And its assets are fairly extensive. So if you were to ask how many Army divisions have a civilian component to them, you would sit there and say, well, no Army divisions have civilian component to them. Same thing with Air Force bomber and fighter wings or Marine Corps battalions. Yet most people would be surprised to learn that one out of five vessels in the active US Navy don't have Navy sailors crewing those vessels. Instead, there are civilian merchant Marines or merchant mariners. Those mariners man vessels in the combat logistics force, in the fleet support and special missions, and in the combat command support role. And Military Sea Lift Command provides direct fleet support, which we're not going to talk about today. These are oilers and ammunition and, and combat store ships that keeps Navy battle groups at sea. What we're going to particularly look at are a force of vessels, two forces of vessels, one that's in what's called the prepositioning role and another that's in the surge sea lift role. Following the Iranian Revolution of 1979 and the subsequent attempt to free American hostages in Tehran, the decision was made to establish what was referred to as an afloat prepositioning force. It went through different iterations. But by the mid 1980s, the United States had established a series of floating squadrons 
around the world, which contained prepositioning equipment for the Marine Corps, for the Navy, for the Army, and for the Air Force. Today, 2022, what we see exists is a shadow of what formerly existed. In terms of the United States Marine Corps, what had previously existed in three squadrons, one based in the Mediterranean, one based in Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, and the third out in the Western Pacific, today only the second and third squadron exists. Those squadrons are made up of notionally seven vessels, although not all vessels are always with the squadrons. Currently, some of the vessels are off station for maintenance and repair, and that's routine throughout this period. But the squadrons are pretty uniform in their composition. Uh, each of the squadrons contain two of those large medium speed roll on roll off vessels that were converted and built after the Persian Gulf War of 1990. They contain two to three of what are referred to as legacy maritime prepositioning ships. These are the ships that were originally built for the squadron. They are reaching the end of their service life. These vessels came into service in the mid 1980s. What's unique about these vessels, ships like the Lummis, the Bobo, Williams, Lopez, and Button, are that not only are they roll on, roll off ships, not only do they have container space on board, but they also have tanks for fuel and water to support up to an entire Marine Expeditionary Brigade for up to 30 days. Each of these two squadrons can support an individual brigade of up to 16,000 Marines. They have all the equipment and necessary stores except for aircraft and other vital equipment that is in short supply and of course the Marines which have to be flown in. But basically, if you go into a port, you have a secure airhead, you fly in your Marines, you fly in your aircraft, you marry up with these squadrons. And in a very short period of time, about three days, if you have a port, about five days, if you have to do it at Anchorage, these vessels also contain the sufficient watercraft to offload offshore and land the cargo over the beach, what's known as a logistics over the shore operation they can sustain up to 16,000 Marines for 30 days. Now, obviously to get to the Ukraine, they would have to deploy, which means sailing from their bases in the, in the Indian Ocean and Western Pacific through the Suez Canal into the Mediterranean and European waters. In addition to the Marine Corps having a flow prepositioning, the US Army also has prepositioning. Now they have prepositioning in several different ways. One way they have it is in shore based prepositioning sites. So, for example, they have in Europe prepositioning sites in Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Poland, and in Italy. This means that units can fly in, the personnel marry up with equipment that's already stored there on the ground broken out and operational use. And we've seen that happen before. This goes back to a concept that was started during the Cold War when you would see these fly-in sites, these what were called Pompka sites throughout Europe. And then the military sealift command in conjunction with the Navy worked with this in what was called reforger operations where the US would sail equipment across the Atlantic and then land it in European ports and the troops would marry up with this. In this case, there's also an afloat prepositioning site for the US Army, what's referred to as APS-3, Army Preposition Stock 3. At the end of the Persian Gulf War, the Army bought into the Marine Corps concept and had eight of the large medium speed roll-on roll-off vessels allocated to it for that purpose. Half of them were used to store a Army Armored Brigade. The other half were used to store Army sustainment and logistics equipment. They also added two container ships for ammunition and two other container ships for theater support equipment. Today, the Army maintains a reduced presence. They have six of the large medium speed rows split fairly evenly between Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean and in the Western Pacific, and two large container ships that carry both ammunition and sustainment gear. And as in the case of the Marine Corps, not all eight vessels are on site, in theater, ready to go. Some vessels are off site, undergoing maintenance and repairs 
as part of their routine operation for both to maintain the ships and the equipment. Finally, the US Air Force charters through the Military Sealift Command two vessels. Uh, these vessels, much like the Army vessels, contain ammunition and equipment for engineering use on forward expeditionary airfields. The two vessels, much like the Army and the Marine Corps, are split between the Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific. Uh, these ammunition equipment laden vessels carry a host of material and were vital in the first Persian Gulf War during the incursion into Afghanistan in 2001 and the Iraq War and would be instrumental for sustaining and supporting Air Force operations in support of any potential operation there. The prepositioning force, Marine, Army, Air Force then would be the first wave that would go in a potential Ukraine situation. Now, the danger of using these vessels is you take them away from their positions in the Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific, meaning that you lose that capability should they be needed in Korea, Taiwan, the Middle East. Uh, there used to be a squadron contained in the Mediterranean, but that was discontinued in 1995 at the end of the Cold War when we thought that everything in Europe was going to be great. Didn't work out that way. So after the prepositioning force, you have what's called the surge sea lift force. And the surge sea lift force are those government owned ships that are maintained in a reduced operating status, what's referred to as ROS, and can be activated by adding merchant mariners drawn from the active fleet onto vessels that are based along the east Gulf of Mexico and west coast of the United States. Uh, these vessels come in a variation of sizes. And all told, you're looking at 41 vessels that are in the ready reserve force. This is a fleet of vessels that was created post Vietnam in 1977. And it is administered by the Maritime Administration under the Department of Transportation. And then seven vessels that are maintained by the Military Seal of Command, those seven LMSRs, those large medium speed Roros. Currently, Nearly all the vessels are in place around at their stations. However, some are off station either in a maintenance period or in the case of some vessels conducting routine cargo transport. Due to the supply chain crisis, there has been a difficulty by the Department of Defense through the Transportation Command and MSC to do routine cargo transfers. Usually you'd be able to charter and obtain American ships or other commercial ships on the high seas for use to conduct routine traffic and more importantly, large unit rotations. Currently, three vessels have been activated to support this mission. The USNS Mendaka, which is a large medium speed row row, has sailed from Norfolk and is heading southbound through the Suez Canal uh, en route into the Indian Ocean with a final destination that I'm not sure of for a routine cargo movement. The Cape Horn, which was activated from its base in San Francisco, was out in Hawaii conducting an operation. It had gone up to Tacoma and then was at Pearl Harbor and has since sailed from there for a destination unknown. And then just most recently, the USNS Bob Hope, the first purpose-built large medium speed Roro, was activated out of Bremerton and has set sail. It was being activated for a routine cargo transfer. The remaining parts of this fleet are based around the United States. And what we're talking about here, again, are the seven remaining large medium speed Roros that are in the MSC fleet. Now, I should mention that a year ago, there were 15 of these in the surge fleet. However, because of issues regarding activations and age, several vessels have been removed. So five former maritime prepositioning ships, these are ships that had been operated by the Marine Corps, but were deemed to be excess, were put into this surge sea lift fleet. Those five vessels have been reduced in their readiness and are now no longer available. Add to it two of the older LMSRs uh, that had been converted from commercial vessels. Uh, of the 20 large medium speed railroads, five were converted from commercial vessels. And just a little tidbit of background news, 
that was one of the reasons I left my uh, career at Military Sealift Command, because I vehemently disagreed with that decision at the time. But two of those ships, the Sugar and the Yano, have been downgraded and are no longer considered as part of this fleet. And then one other of these LMSRs have been removed and shifted back into the Army prepositioning role. So now there's six in the Army prepositioning role. So you have a grand total here of seven large medium speed row rows. And as I mentioned, Mendaka and Bob Hope are both out on routine transportations and plans are underway to activate Gilead also for that role. So seven large medium speed row rows operated by the Military Sealift Command through commercial companies. They, they don't operate on themselves. They use commercial companies for this. And then you have this. This is the ready reserve force. These are those other ships I was referring to. 35 roll-on, roll-off ships, including eight of the fast sea lift ships. Now, these ships are old. Uh, they were built in the 70s. So we're talking uh, over 50 years old right now, these vessels, yet they are extremely high speed, 33 knots. Uh, they have been the backbone of military sea lift for a long time, but they can only carry half of what a large medium speed row row can carry. And then 27 other commercial vessels. Now I should note that in 2019, there was a test activation of these vessels and the vessels that are held by MSC. According to standards set by the US Transportation Command, there should be 85% readiness in this fleet, meaning if you have a fleet, 85% of these ships should activate. In September 2019, when they conducted that readiness activation, only 40% was available to activate. So there's a lot of questions about whether or not these vessels would be activated or could activate. I should note that in case of an operation to go and support and move forces, you need about four LMSRs, which are over 300,000 square feet, to move something akin to a brigade of forces. Uh, you would need substantially more of these vessels because they're smaller to do the same operation. Plus, you would also have to relocate. About a third of these vessels are on the East Coast, about a third are on the Gulf of Mexico coast, and about the third are on the West Coast. So if you're going to Europe, obviously you got to get those Pacific Coast vessels off there through the Panama Canal up into the Gulf Coast and the East Coast, or send them across the Pacific, which is a really long way to go. So a lot of these vessels too, I should note, have multiple vessels in their class. And one of the things you would expect, for example, the five KDs, uh, those vessels, you can you know, expect to see four of the five activated because one of the problems with having older vessels is lack of spare parts. And one of the things that is done at times is rob from one vessel to get the other vessels out. Now you can sit there and say that's not done, but there was just a story about getting the carrier Gerald Ford out to sea and they're stealing from the USS John Kennedy, which is being built to get that vessel out. And these vessels, reserve vessels are much older. And so we're seeing that here. These vessels, the 35 roll on roll off ships, the four crane vessels, which are uh, container vessels with these large cranes that can be used to offload containers from other vessels should shoreside cranes be damaged. And two aviation maintenance support vessels, these support Marine Corps air wings. They provide logistics and repair shops. All of those vessels could be called upon for use in a potential sea lift operation to Ukraine. So that covers two of the three legs. A float prepositioning would be your first line of defense to send vessels there, preloaded, fully equipped, fully operational, manned, ready to go. Next would be the surge sea lift. Five days to activate those vessels. You'd still have to move them to ports of embarkation, load them, and then sail them across. The readiness and availability of the vessels is a bit of a question because of the past track record with them. The other element that you would need is sustainment. How do you sustain forces over there? In other words, the routine shipment of goods to keep those forces in operation, beans, bullets, ammunition, you name it, you would need sustainment going over. And that comes from the US Commercial Merchant Marine. Under the old Merchant Marine Act of 1936, the US had a program where it helped finance and build commercial vessels, what was known as construction, and operation differential subsidies. Well, that program went away in the 80s and 90s. And one of the things that resulted as, or was a result of that, 
was the commercial vessels in international trade for the United States disappeared, basically went away. And the US realized, particularly during the Persian Gulf War of 1990 to 91, that we needed a American sustainment force to ensure that our troops and forces overseas could be sustained. We couldn't always rely on foreign flag carriers to do this. Now, you can sit there and say, well, wait a minute, Sal. You know, some of the biggest foreign carriers out there are European, Maersk, Hophog, uh, CMA, CGM, for example. They're all European based. Can't we not count on them? Well, the issue you have, if you go back and look at the history of this across the 20th century, is number one, will those commercial companies provide those vessels? And if you get into a war risk scenario, number one, you have to provide war risk insurance. Uh, insurance rates will climb. If you look at the beginning of World War I, World War II, what kept ships from sailing wasn't really the threat of German U-boats and enemy attack. It was escalating freight rates and escalating insurance rates. That was the big issue. And many companies may keep their vessels in port at anchor or avoid the area entirely to preserve them. The other issue you have is a lot of vessels are just too big to get in and too much of a risk. Are you going to risk an ultra large container vessel and losing 20,000 boxes on board to carry you know, some American military equipment that could be subjected to potential attack? So the US would rely on these 60 vessels that make up what's called the maritime security program. Now there's a mix of these. There are roll on roll off ships. These are vessels that are commercial car carriers, but can also carry military equipment. They would supplement those 35 roll-on, roll-off ships that are in the Ready Reserve Force and the seven LMSRs that MSC possesses. However, the issue becomes, are they immediately available? In other words, are they not under contract hauling goods? One of the reasons why you're seeing three LMSRs and the Cape Horn out there right now is because these vessels are booked. They're moving cargo. And so the availability of them would have to be made enforced, basically. And it would, don't get me wrong, this, that's exactly what would happen. But there's also the positioning of these ships. Many of these ships are involved in round the world service. So they would have to be repositioned and moved. Uh, you have container ships, a mix of geared container ships, which we've seen a lot recently. Uh, Amazon, Ikea, Walmart have all used these type of ships to avoid the big ports of LA and Long Beach. And so they're using those. Those geared container ships and heavy lift ships would be instrumental, especially getting into ports that may not have container terminals or go into terminals where there are not container cranes. And then finally, we have container ships, 23 large container ships. These are operated by American versions of overseas companies, Maersk, Hophog, and CMA, CGM through APL, for example. These are gearless container ships. They would have to go into ports and terminals that have container cranes. Now, the issue with that is availability and getting in there. Will the ports prioritize these geared container ships? And one of the critical things right now is, is the lack of tankers in this fleet. There are only two tankers in this fleet. Now, fortunately, the tanker market is pretty depressed. There are a lot of Jones Act. These are protected cabotage coastal ships that are in the U.S. fleet. Uh, tankers in the Crowley and the OSG fleet, for example, that could be activated to supplement and move oil across. But this sustainment would be essential. You need this to maintain your forces across an ocean. And again, Russia has a fairly small Navy, but it does have a Navy and it has a submarine force and it has the potential to cause risk. Understand you don't have to sink one ship to cause insurance rates to climb and escalate. We've seen this happen time and time again throughout history. Now, fortunately, the United States has done a series of exercises starting in 2020 that have really tested this out. Now, COVID impacted these quite a bit, but back in 2020, the United States initiated what was called Defender Europe 2020. And this was a massive exercise that basically took forces from the United States, deployed them across about 20,000 forces. They drew equipment from pre-positioning sites across Europe and also equipment that was sailed across to Met. A lot of commercial vessels in the maritime security program were used for this. 
uh, American roll-on, roll-off carriers, Secor, uh, Waterman, uh, Central Gulf Lines, uh, 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 Farrell Lines were all used to get those ships across. And so we saw 20,000 troops draw 13,000 pieces of equipment. And then those forces were landed, they were moved to the Baltic states, to Poland, and then they were redeployed back out. A smaller version of this was undertaken in 2021, in Defender 2021. And unfortunately, because of COVID and because of, of issues and limitations, much smaller operation was undertaken, much more of a NATO alliance force was done with this. Only 2,100 uh, American forces were, were, were sent over, National Guard forces were sent over in this. But Defender 2020 and 2021 really set the stage for how you would undertake an operation should the U.S. need to deploy forces in response to Russian aggression toward Ukraine. So what does a potential offensive operation look like? And there's a lot of people looking at this right now. This came out of the study of war, looking at the forces that are currently around Ukraine. And obviously the, the way to get to reinforce Ukraine is not to go directly to Ukraine because number one, the major port for the Ukraine was seized by Russia back in 2014. And that was the port of Sevastopol down here in the Crimea. Plus, you don't want to be landing forces and equipment under attack or within range and threat of an attack. So whatever would happen, Ukraine would have to hold off or we would have to land forces prior to this, because basically Ukraine is, is, is largely surrounded on three sides in the north across from Belarus on the Russian border and from the south here from the Crimea, we know that the Russians are redeploying assets from the Baltic fleet to the Black Sea. Uh, LSTs and several other vessels are on the way there to kind of reinforce them. We also have to deal with the issue that the Russians have forces, naval forces in the Mediterranean. And this is a substantial issue. Three Kilo class submarines are located in the Mediterranean, two in Syria and one by Algeria. And those naval forces pose a threat to unarmed, unprotected merchant vessels. So if you look at the deployment here, use a little bit of Google Earth here to kind of do this. If your pre-positioning forces are coming either from Western Europe or the Indian Ocean, they would have to come through the Bab el Mandab, which is a choke point. And we've seen Houthi rebels take shots at vessels, lay mines in that area you would have to get permission from the Egyptians to go through the Suez Canal. Again, the Egyptians have allowed this in the past, in 1990, again in 2003, they have not stopped it, but there is the potential that the Egyptians could say no. Even if they say yes, then you have to deal with these vessels coming out of the Suez into the Eastern Mediterranean and heading to potential ports. Where can they go? Well, they can go here to Northern Greece, to Thessalonica, port right here. Uh, this is the old Salonika that was used in World War I, but we've used this port before in routine cargo operations. Uh, if you go into Thessalonica in northern Greece, then you have to travel overland through Bulgaria, Romania to get to Ukraine. You can go in through the Adriatic, uh, Dubrovnik, and a few other ports here that can get in split in Croatia. Then you have to travel through either Hungary, Serbia, to get to Romania and then Ukraine? Or do you go up into Northern Europe to Antwerp, Rotterdam, offload there, potentially into Bremen or Hamburg? 20, they use ports in the Baltic. They use ports in the Baltic states and in Poland, but the issue you always have here is Kaliningrad, the leftover holdover state here that's part of Russia. And the Baltic is notoriously dangerous for a variety of reasons, shallow water, easy to mine, easy to interdict. There's a large force here in Kaliningrad that could potentially interdict any force coming in. Every mining exercise that ever takes place in the Baltic, even just routine mining exercises, usually finds leftover World War II mines. So you have a few ports you would have to look at. Obviously landing in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, Antwerp in Belgium, Hamburg of Germany requires the permission of those ports. And then of course, transportation through those countries, through Poland into the Ukraine. So again, 
not advocating this, not talking about this will happen, but should it happen, that is the scenario that would unfold. How would you conduct sea lift missions across? And the United States maintains a very large capable sea lift force. I'd make the argument that no one matches the United States' ability to deploy forces around the world. However, it has limitations. It has limitations. We cut back on the size of the prepositioning force over time. We cut back from three to two Marine Corps squadrons. Those Marine Corps squadrons only carry about between 40 to 60 percent of the equipment necessary for a Marine brigade. The rest of it would have to be transported from the United States along with the Marines and the air wing. The Army has cut back on their float prepositioning with plans to maybe potentially cut back even further. Uh, that could be significant. The Air Force, which once had four vessels prepositioned, is now down to two. Uh, the third sea lift ships are aging. They are aging, and availability of them are a question mark. If you activate the 41 roll-on, roll-off ships, the four crane ships, the two aviation logistics support ships, and the seven LMSRs, there is a question about availability. Some ships are in the yards for routine maintenance. But again, these are vessels that range anywhere from 20 to nearly 45 years of age, almost 50 in some cases. And whether or not you get all of them is a question mark. Again, we only assume 85% is the target. We're probably shooting around 70% right now. And then the commercial merchant marine, the maritime security program, uh, obviously, Maersk lines, Hophog lines, container ships would be essential. They operate along routes. Hophog Lloyd operates from the U.S. East Coast to Northern Europe. Maersk operates from the East Coast of the United States through the Mediterranean to the Middle East in Europe. They would be essential. Those roll-on, roll-off ships, which operate worldwide, would be essential to supplement the surge sea lift vessels. But we would also need to draw tankers from the Jones Act fleet from the commercial fleet to do it. We would have to draw mariners from the commercial fleet to plus up the surge fleet. And that's just routine. We're not even talking about potential interdiction operations. And whether or not we get commercial assistance is also a big question. If you look at the first Persian Gulf War in 1990 to 91, American ships carried about three quarters of the cargo across. We relied on commercial ships for the other quarter. So. That's a quick run through of a sea lift operation to support Ukraine in case of war. I hope you found this video enjoyable. All this is open source too. Let me be clear. I didn't give you any classified information. All this has been written, published, and is out there for you to find. And I'll have links to it in the show notes. So I'm not providing any top secret information out there. So don't think I'm violating operational security. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, and I hope you did please subscribe to my channel. We talk about military sea lift. We talk about military. We talk about commercial. We talk about all things shipping on this channel. So please subscribe. Hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out. Give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment. Share it across social media, except for the nasty Russians. Don't send this to Vladimir Putin, please. Uh, but feel free to share it across. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think. And hopefully everything gets better. We end this nonsense about potential conflict. And we can get back to the more pressing shipping issues is getting rid of the backlog of vessels at LA and Long Beach. So until the next video, Sal, signing off.